Warning, this podcast contains spoilers for Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny as well as the first four films in the Indiana Jones franchise. Hello, my name is Jason Concepcion. And I'm Rosie Knight. And welcome to X-Ray Vision, the Crooked Media Podcast, where we dive deep into your favorite shows, movies, comics, and pop culture. In this episode, in the previously on, we are jumping into the Jeep or into the dinghy <laughs> or whichever your preferred Indiana Jones theme the travel method fridge. is. The lead lined fridge. The lead lined fridge, a very smart idea, I must just say. And we're going to look back on the Indiana Jones franchise to lead into our airlock, where we'll be talking about Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. And in Nerd Out, we have a theory on Secret Invasion. Coming up. Previously on. Bum bum ba da dum bum ba ba dum ba 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 da 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 Technically a prequel, we'll get into that in our recap. Followed by Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, 1989. Followed by Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, 2008. Followed this year with a resounding, eh, Indiana <laughs> Jones and the Dial of Destiny. But let's start with Raiders of the Lost Ark. Rosie, we open in 1936. Oh, it's a long time And we time meet ago. intrepid archaeologist, tenured university professor, adventurer and grave robber Indiana Jones on a mission to recover a golden idol from an ancient temple in the jungles of Peru. A place he, where he will return later in this series. <laughs> His aide to camp double crosses him, setting up a theme of the franchise. Rude. Rude. And he's nearly crushed by a boulder, but he does get out alive thanks to, you know, his guile and his trusty bullwhip. Unfortunately, the idol is then stolen from his hands by his uh, rival in the field of archaeology, Dr. Belloc in Indiana has to flee for his life. Back at university, where he teach again, he is a teacher, He's and apparently fending off advances from his students at all times. A lot Suspect. of students. We'll Suspicious. get back to this. Yes. Uh, the U.S. Army Intelligence uh, comes calling, and they tell Dr. Jones that uh, they have uh, unscrambled some communiques from a guy named Adolf Hitler you may have heard of. And it turns out Hitler is obsessed with ancient artifacts, and the Nazis are currently digging for something in Egypt, and nobody knows what's going on. Jones is like, oh, I think they found uh, the uh, this fabled legendary city where the Hebrew Ark of the Covenant is maybe kept in a place called the Well of Souls. Uh, and the U.S. Army intelligence guys are like, wow, I guess we came to the right guy. Um, tell us more. And it turns out the Nazis are also looking for a guy who specialized in the Ark of the Covenant and named Abner Ravenwood. And Jones also knows him. Mm. More to the point, Jones knows Abner's daughter, Marion. And when I say no, what I mean is Jones used to have sexual relations with Marion when, in her words, she was a child. And you could do the math on how old she's supposed to be in the movie. It's a bad look for uh, for Sensing Dr. Pan, Indiana yeah. Jones. But it was 1981, and I guess and things were different. And I guess it was 1936 <laughs> in his time. Yeah, and things were also different. <laughs> uh, anyway, the army is like, okay, go uh, go after Abner Ravenwood. Jones uh, knows where he is. He thinks he's probably in Nepal. He goes to Nepal. He finds Mary in there. She's running a bar and she is now a full blown alcoholic. And honestly, the dark take on rewatch is like because she's really mad at him. And that anger like bubbles over quite mm -hmm. easily. It, and it's that kind of like infamous snippet of dialogue where she says, like, I was a child, yada, yada, yada. He, like the dark read on it is like she is medicating the trauma mm -hmm. from her relationship with full-grown adult Dr. Indiana Jones. By living in a bar in rural Nepal and getting drunk every single day, drinking people under the bar. 
So, but she, but luckily she has probably the strongest liver of any human. Being she's powerful. I, I love Mary. She's a Ravenhorn. very she's very powerful out. and again a high functioning alcoholic. Mm-hmm. It turns out Abner is dead. Uh, but but what about his artifacts related to Tannis, the city where the Ark probably is? Uh, what about that stuff? Namely, a medallion. Is that still around? Marion's like, no. Uh, come back tomorrow. Maybe we'll talk about it. Uh, unfortunately, the Nazis are also in town, led by a very ominous Gestapo officer, uh, Tote, and he is looking for the same stuff. Jones and Marion just barely escape with the medallion, but unbeknownst to them, Tote has a partial image of the medallion burned into his hand and at a high enough resolution that it's actually useful. Next stop, Egypt, where we meet Indy's friend and sometime fixer Gimli. Um, I mean, sorry, I mean Sala. His crew is has been hired by the Nazis to do some digging, and Gimli says the Nazis are really stupid except for this guy, Baloch. And then Indy's like, no, 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 you idiot, that's Belloc. Which, which, like, how did he, I guess he saw his name, like, on a call sheet? Like, how does that work? How do you get I, his name wrong? I also when just want to say, I also just want to say, there are so many Kenner six inch remake figures of Belloc in every Target. So if you, <laughs> yeah, I'm right. always like, why is he there? Who like, wants Belloc? Who wants, who wants <laughs> Belloc? I mean, he does have a cool, like, kind of like a, a coat on, but like, yeah. I don't know. Maybe he found one of the toys, and that's uh, that's how he gets the name now. <laughs> how did he get it wrong? And, but it turns out the Nazis are appear to be close to finding the Well of Souls. Little does Indy know that he is being spied on. But by uh, who? While he's, re- well, it's a spy monkey. A spy <laughs> monkey course. that is working to the Nazis. Oh, I can't believe that the monkey's Nazis- a Nazi. I'm so disappointed in that. <laughs> I know. The Nazis, it turns out, have perhaps a team of spy monkeys, certainly at least one. And uh, uh, they set loose a team of assassins to kill Indy in the streets of Cairo. But of course, he escapes because we're only like 45 minutes into the movie. Spy monkey helps the Nazis capture Marion. Rude. And Indy, thinking Marion is dead, honors her in the way that she would like to be honored, which means he starts binge drinking. Sensible. Belloc calls for him and uh, does some monologuing, basically says, like, you're the good version of me, but, you, you know, you're going to be me soon enough and yada, yada, yada. And uh, Indy is eventually saved from being murdered by Belloc and Belloc's assassins by a gang of street kids. Um, spy monkey dies from poison dates, R. which R. allow, which allow Gimli to realize that the dates are poisoned, <laughs> bad dates and, <laughs> uh, and saves Indy's life. And Indy never thanks him, by the way. Rude. Um, I think so. Um, Indy sneaks into, uh, the Nazi camp. He finds the actual location of the Well of Souls because he knows that the uh, the staff that the Nazis are using is, is too long. He discovers Marion, who's still alive, but uh, because the Ark is really the pressing thing right now, he leaves Marion. <laughs> He's in like, Bye. Bye. Are you I an ancient go. artifact that Hitler <laughs> wants? No, no, you're not. Fuck off. So, so I'll see you later. Um, uh, that night. Indy braves uh, the Well of Souls, which is filled with snakes and other he dangers, hates and he recover. He hates them. And famously, does not like snakes. Not a fan. Uh, not a fan, and he recovers the Ark. Meanwhile, Belloc has grown obsessed with Marion in a very sure. short amount of time, and he gets her a dress that looks suspiciously like a wedding dress, and asks her to wear it, and. Marion, meanwhile, is plotting her escape, and so she figures, let's have a drinking game, which I'm really good at. She gets Belloc really, really drunk, and just as she's about to grab a knife and either stab him or just threaten him and escape, uh, Gestapo o- Officer Tote shows up with the most kinky clothes <laughs> hanger of all fucking time. <laughs> He's ready. I was, he was ready for some shit. And you know what? I want to stop here because we are going to talk about Dial of Destiny and the wonderful Mads Mikkelsen. And I love Mads Mikkelsen and everything. Same. I will never turn away the sight of the wonderful Mads Mikkelsen on any kind of screen I'm watching. But I will say, I do like... One of the things I like about Raiders is that the most ominous Gestapo officer is really just like a geek. Yeah, you know, yeah, 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 He's just like yeah, yeah. not, he's he not the one formidable that looking at all. He's scared of because he is like secretly the psycho. You know, he you don't know yeah. what he's thinking. Like that's a scary character. Also, like I will say, 
one of the most enjoyable things about these movies, which is, as we will get into, a very patchy and, and really terribly racist the further into them you get. Yeah, they're but really like, quite are. It is great to see just like Nazis are just getting killed. Now, earlier, Indiana Jones was Willy killing nilly. some other people, didn't love to see it. But when he's killing a Nazi or somebody's beating up a Nazi or drinking a Nazi to an early grave, it's, great. You, it's just that that's a feel good situation. I feel like that's part of why these movies have held such a long esteem is like, it's very rare that you can yes. watch a movie and feel good about people being killed. But Indiana Jones, you're like, come it's on, Nazis. sorry, bro, you're a Nazi. And Indiana famously has never, ever, ever been a Nazi sympathizer except when he slept with full-blown Nazi Dr. Elsa. He didn't we'll know she was a it. Nazi. Just saying. Just we'll saying, get to just that, saying, that in a, we'll saying, get saying. That in a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, the next morning, Belloc intercepts Jones and Gimli as they are removing the Ark. Once again, he is right there. He takes the Ark for Hitler. The Nazis lock Jones in the Well of Souls along with Marion, much to uh, Belloc's chagrin. But of course, they escape because now we're only an hour and 15 into the movie. Jones manages to steal the Ark back from Belloc. He loads it onto a ship board for the States. Uh, Jones and Marion share a cabin, which is... We're right back into it, I guess, trying to rekindle that old statutory magic. But Indy <laughs> is too is too banged up uh, to do anything, and he falls asleep. Aww. And, of course, the Nazis intercept the boat. They take back the Ark. They seize Marion, despite, and this was record scratch shit here for me. This is a movie for PG movie for kids. The Despite the fact that the ship's captain is like, hey, leave the girl so we can use her to offset the costs of the trip. Boo! Yes, it's <laughs> tomorrow, like, tomorrow. Wow. <laughs> and again, a movie that I enjoy. I do enjoy Raiders, oh, but this too, is a movie too, for children. Like, this was a PG movie for kids. They they, um, they use the pulp <laughs> trappings to do some, yes. to lean into their worst pre -code, tendencies. Almost yeah, like yeah, a yeah, pre-code yeah. movie they're for kids. They're having a lot of, they're like, well, it's based on stuff from a time when things were really racist and misogynist. So let's just go for it. <laughs> let's just go for it. Belloc uh, is absolutely thrilled to have his girl Marion back. Indy sneaks onto the Nazi submarine, rides it back to the Nazi Guns of Navarone style base. He ambushes Belloc and the Nazis with an RPG. But then Belloc is like, come on. This is like a terrible climax to the film if you just blow us all up <laughs> don't you want to see us open the thing and indy is like yes i do that evening belloc intones a hebrew prayer he opens the ark and while cameras roll magic fire uh, melts everyone who is looking at the ark and jones and marion survive by not looking at it really smart by indiana jones okay so let's talk about this so then sure. the, like this is one of the most in the one thing I love about Raiders is like it is like a really pulpy B movie style film, right? Yeah. But it it also is like an intrinsically interesting cinematic conversation starter because you could arguably say, and it has been said, it's been said by me in articles, it's been said in a yeah. now very famous Big Bang Theory cold open, probably the only time yeah. we will ever mention the Big Bang Theory on this show. But like <laughs> Indiana Jones does not really affect he doesn't do, any he of doesn't the do events anything. in this film. There is the end of the movie is God burning everybody's eyes he out because do they tried to touch the Ark of the Covenant. That would have happened whether or not Indiana Jones was involved. Now, arguably, the him changing yeah. the, the, the stick, maybe, but someone else might have worked that out. Like, he doesn't really play much of a role in the actual actions of the movie. He does not move it along in the traditional way of a protagonist. And you could argue that the movie is the same with or without him. I just find that so interesting and weird. I think it's very, very weird. And also, I mean, you know, Spielberg is just like in his bag because you don't oh. know. Like, no, I, you never, I never notice noticed until you that Indiana does nothing. The no. hero of the film does not do he anything. He is arguably in the last not act. even the protagonist in the way that we <laughs> understand what a protagonist is because the Nazis would have died anyway. Like, they, arguably, you could say he, he changed whether or not they'd be able to open it. But I think you could argue that somebody else may have been able to do that. It's so weird. But like you said, this is a movie that's all about vibes. Because you're just so, you're in the, it's like, oh, you picked up like a pulp novel and you're yeah. just going with it and you wish it wasn't racist. But oh, look, there's like a, a cool, you know, a, a, a boulder's going to knock him over. It's, he's running away from a boulder. By the way, I just want to say that moment is actually directly stolen from a Scrooge McDuck comic. 
if you can believe it <laughs> directly there's a good comic book uh bit of knowledge for you but yeah like you're just vibing on it but it always makes me laugh and in a recap when you start to see it it's just like okay so indiana jones gets there doesn't do anything they open it everybody dies and then he just like puts it in a warehouse <laughs> well I, I think again i think spielberg was just you know it's he, spielberg was on a truly the midst of a legendary Whew. iconic cinematic run and i, I just mean... think the way over the course of this film, they build up the Ark of the Covenant, build it mm -hmm. up, build it up, build it up. You can get away with the final act of the movie being, hey, what the fuck's inside this thing? And yeah. And watch us microwave The original all Pulp these Fiction uh, suitcase. It's like and you want to know what's in there. It's also because there are essentially no special effects in this movie until this sequence. It just kind of knocks you back. Especially the face melt, which remains incredibly powerful. I mean, we all still think about it at like all times. Like yeah. that's what one of the first things that you think about when you watch, when you think about Indiana Jones. And one of the most interesting things is that actually was like so influential that there's like this also very offensive, I will just put that out there, but like a, a B movie called Street Trash that was directed by J. Michael Murrow. And it's like, the whole movie is like that effect. It's basically that this booze get this like booze gets infected and anyone who drinks it melts. And the movie is called like a melt movie. And it was kind of that trauma style thing. But that literally is just replicating the famous face melting sequence, which I watched so many times as a kid and also like absolutely yeah. devastated me and terrified me as a kid. Oh, it's, it's so scary. It's so good. Actually, you know what? I think Steven Spielberg... You make a great point, because the truth is, if you think about the movies that he made his name with, Jewel, uh, Jaws, you know, those movies yeah. actually a lot of times... Uh, close Encounters. Yeah, Close Encounters. I mean, those movies were actually very unconventional. Like Jaws, yes. obviously you had all the issues with the shark, so you barely see the shark, and then when you do see it at the end, it's this huge impact moment, and you create that really weird... Under, half underwater, yeah. half above water POV of Close the shark. Close Encounters is one of the craziest slow burn movies of all Ever. time. With nothing, almost guys, nothing. I'm, make I it some mashed potato movie. mountains. Yeah, just but chilling. like, but in the in the it, in contrast to like a movie release today, almost nothing happens yeah. over the first like hour of that movie. It's Character just one guy flipping out. ET, just a bunch yeah. of kids and like a weird puppet. So actually, in that way, the idea that he kind of made a protagonistless movie where the character who is the titular character is not really the protagonist who drives on the story at all. That actually makes a lot of sense because he was always doing things in a kind of unusual way. He absolutely was. And Raiders of the Lost Ark was followed by Temple of Doom. We open in Hong Kong, 1935. So this is a prequel. And one of the most interesting things to me on rewatch was just what a different guy Indiana was only one year earlier. Of course, in Raiders, it's got to get it in a museum. This belongs in a museum. We got to get this in a museum. One year earlier, he's just like out here flipping artifacts for diamonds. Like just seemingly the museum thing had slipped his mind at this point. Like he's just out here looking for cash, like quick cash. I'm like, I'm guessing that he was like meant to be doing it for some other magnanimous reason because he's always finding something to do but really i think they're essentially setting him up as a bit more of like a a rogue who works on his own yes. mo moral and ethical compass because then we end up with the main macguffin of this which wouldn't really necessarily work with the museum argument agreed um and again this this indiana jones a, a, a real hero although roguish in raiders is not above like taking a dinner fork and sticking it into a bystander's oh. ribs and saying like I will stab this woman unless you give me what I need. He is doing Just this like, is one of the most bonkers cold opens of all time and you can definitely It's wonderful. Like, if you if you if they made movies like this today that were still like this and not like Dial of Destiny, they'd be like each movie is going to take from a different time period and yeah. will showcase the different influences of filmmakers and choreographers. That is essentially what Spielberg was doing, but without any of the PR. Like, it's so different from Raiders and just absolutely bonkers. It, 
This cold open actually might be my favorite thing in the entire series. It is in a movie that is is crazy for its highs and lows. It is it's very it it's filled with adventure and excitement has maybe the best personal relationships of any of the movies yeah. but also is like horrendously racist. Mm -hmm. Um and this cold open is it has madcap action. It is a wonderful homage to the uh, musical work of uh, Busby Berkeley yeah. with this kind of like wonderful dance routine that opens the just opens up opens with a full musical, full just like, musical sure. where, where we meet showgirl uh, Willie, played by Kate Capshaw, yeah. uh, later Steven Spielberg's wife. When we say highs and lows, I think the character of Willie is certainly one of the lows. She just exists to be like. I'm a woman. Annoyed and this screaming. Is so oh my god! Is that a spider? Ah! You no, know? her costuming is fantastic. <laughs> fantastic, and she and Kate is a wonderful actress who does it with charm. It just but they don't the, they give, her give her a lot. Any. That's I think they again, don't give it, her anything. That classic yeah. thing of like, oh well, it's set in the old days, so we can make it as misogynistic as we presume. But actually, I just want to say I talk about this a lot. When you actually go back and watch an old noir movie. Actually, a lot of times, one, there were women directing them. Ida Lupino, the hitchhiker, watch it. It's yeah. unbelievable. But two, a lot of times the female characters in them were actually like super complex and like weird and dark and smart and clever and funny. And I think this is almost where you get into that parody versus homage or whatever. They sort of think, oh, well, it's a femme fatale. It's like a woman. She's scared. She doesn't know what she's doing. That's how it was back then. And it's doesn't actually really represent the era she does no they fatality. were making. No, there's no there's fatality. No, there's, there's no cool no double fatality. side. Yeah. I don't even know what this would be. She's like almost, she's almost the comedy relief, but she's she also is the comic not relief, because sure. they don't give her a lot of like gags. It's not in the usual way. The jokes, she is at the butt of the jokes by being the one who doesn't want to go on the adventure, who doesn't want to be involved, who hates bugs. She or, is kind of the, like Jones is the straight man and then they cut to her freaking out about like the horribly racist uh, feast that they have oh, or yeah. the spiders or like- The monkey you know, brains. The, the monkey brains yeah. or the food in the village not being up to snuff, that kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, more about the highs, of course, this is the feature film debut of Kehi Kwan, who ah, is wonderful the best. as as uh, Indiana Jones's assistant fixer, uh, young short round. Uh, the diamond deal that Jones is working on goes sideways. Uh, and so uh, Dr. Jones, Willie, and Short Round have to escape via plane, which eventually crashes in the Himalayas. And Jones and company survive by sledding down the mountain in an inflatable boat, which they dive out of the crash and plane in. And so for and go everyone down who- down a mountain. Go a down the Himalayas. Mountains, a mountain in to... an inflatable thingy. And every single one of you watched this as a kid and rewatched it as an adult and thought, and that said, looks this cool is as fun. shit. That yeah, that's right. That's fine. So remember this when we get to uh, Kingdom skull. of the Crystal Skull and, and the lead line uh, refrigerator. Okay. They eventually come to rest near a village somewhere in northern India. Let's stop here. Mm -hmm. So the government of India read this script and said, this is like horrendous. Racist. It's, it's, it's offensive. It paints uh, Indian culture in a... Uh, inaccurate and horrendous light mm -hmm. and uh, we'd like you to tweak the film tweak the script to make it you know more an accurate depiction of Indian culture and the production was like no let's just shoot in Sri Lanka instead so the I film just, was shot in Sri Lanka just need to say that is like the least you can do like how how hard would it have been to just be like yeah, sure. Who who noticed this in your office? What's the, so to, what's the bad stuff? Let's talk to them what's for the, Well, for instance, we don't eat eyeball soup. Yeah. Or, or you know what? Live when, snakes. If we, if we do eat offal, we don't eat it out of a monkey's head. Every yeah. culture eats offal. And by the offal, way, every culture eats offal. Yeah. Thank you. But like, Blood yeah. sausage, anyone? How, how, how little they were asked to do. And yet. They and said yet. no. And if I'm not mistaken... I believe that the little village that they built in Sri Lanka for this is actually still there. It was oh. at least when I was younger. It was a, it was a tourist destination that people talked about quite a lot because they just left it there. As is the want of Hollywood production. So Jones and company are like, "Hey, can you just send us to like the nearest town with a telephone?" But the villagers are like, "No, 
we need you to stop at the Maharaja's palace because our children are disappearing and we're all starving. And this is somehow connected to the theft of our secret Sankara stone. And so uh, Indian Jones, please go figure it out. Jones and friends go there. They meet the, the local British colonial forces uh, and they are treated to the aforementioned horrendous feast, which includes, as we mentioned, eyeball soup, live snakes, monkey brains, et cetera. Stuff and not any rice. Not real. Like, just nothing. Not like, any no, real. Not anything that you would actually see somebody eat. Just ridiculous, right. corny shit. Uh, Jones discovers that a thuggy cult led by the ominous Molaram have been kidnapping local kids to use a slave labor to dig up the rest of the Shankara stones. And also Molaram uh, does crazy stuff like pull the beating heart out of living people Kalima. all the time. He's doing this. Kalima. He's just doing it all the time. He's doing He's it all doing the time. He's doing it Can't on a it. regular ass basis. Loves it. The film is has a really dark gory tone that i actually quite like it's, it was the reason that when i was a kid i i, yeah. I would always return to this movie like yeah even, and and even as i got older and understood like how horrifically racist it was like it seemed like a fantasy to me but when i was a kid so i didn't really put it together as much but like the darkness especially when you get into the the voodoo kind of like horror elements even the feast actually is played very much for horror which plays into horror, that horrific yes. racist shit but yeah when you get down into the caverns and they're sacrificing the kids and everything it's really bleak i mean when he when molaram pulls the heart out it's like the face melt from raiders yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it's and right there pulls they, it out of india yeah. you see it like pushing through the chest oh I always my remember gosh that and then of course indy uh is you know, turned into a zombie, an evil <gasps> zombie Shocking. at a certain point, and it's really, really scary. And there's that man, that scene that sticks with me even now when Short Round is like, "I love you, Indy. Please wake up." And and Indy is like hitting him and stuff, mm -hmm. and it's, and and Kei Kwan is crying, and yeah, he actually just burns Indy to wake it. him up. Very, very dark and very, very violent. In fact, um, two months after Temple of Doom's release, the MPAA at the behest of Spielberg would create the PG-13 rating because PG, this this movie, mm -hmm. and Gremlins really, really pushed the envelope of what PG could be. Yeah. Uh, eventually, Indy, with significant help from Short Round, uh, defeats Molaram, frees the kids, returns to Shankara Stones, and uh, the British colonial forces are victorious, gunning down maybe many of the thuggy cult. And yeah. that movie. How about he should have helped get rid of those colonial forces? Can I just say that? <laughs> this was also just one of the only times, just wanted, not to give Indiana Jones any credit, because I wouldn't like to do that, you know? But I will say, nice to see him return a stone. He usually will just uh, yes. be stealing that stone to put it in a museum. You know, I'm gl good for him for returning that stone. Wish he'd learn a lesson there and continued that throughout his life. We go to Last Crusade, and this is a film with a uh, notably lighter touch than Temple of Doom, mm -hmm. a more adventurous, humor-filled movie, and I think it's the best movie of the I franchise. I think it's the best one. I think it combines what both movies did well and manages to yeah. eschew a lot of what they did less well. And yeah, just very fun. This actually has my favorite cold open of all the trilogy. One of the most I mean, impactful cinematic moments yeah. for me. I still think about it regularly. I, I think it's just wonderful. So yeah, this is a joy. I, I, I this is my favorite. So that, uh, that aforementioned cold open takes place in Utah. Uh, in the teens, uh, we meet the young Indiana Jones with a, a wonderful long mop of server hair. Um, Played by River Phoenix. Life by the late River Phoenix, mm. as who is wonderful in this it's role. It's so fun. You want to see a whole movie about him. It has this great you circus really train chase. You learn about why he's afraid of snakes, where he got his look, which is a really weird law <laughs> that they, <laughs> yeah, that, I, yeah apparently like he just he just got his entire look from a guy who, who gave like, him a hat after he bested him like this <laughs> guy he literally him. great beats indiana jones as a child and indiana jones is like better just base my entire look vibe steez aesthetic everything yeah just gotta be basing on him as a teen this kid was like this shit's gotta be in a museum and by he the way, museums. as a teen, 
He loved it. The zeal for museums, Cross of Coronado, that belongs in a museum. Even then, you know, uh, young Indiana Jones was like, he was passionate about museums. Back (laughs) in the present at school, uh, Dr. Jones get his gets his dad's journal in the mail and he discovers that his dad, who is a medievalist, uh, has disappeared. Apparently, while on a quest for the legendary Holy Grail, Woo! a.k.a. Uh, J.C.'s mug. Walter Donovan, the financier behind this quest for the Grail, uh, invites Dr. Jones over uh, and he says, hey, uh, why don't you go look for your dad? You know, we were really yeah, close to finding the." Yeah, what's he, we were really close to finding the grail. Uh, why don't you go? Jones and his buddy, Dr. Marcus Brody, head to Venice on Dad's trail. There they meet full-blown Nazi beauty, Dr. Elsa Schneider, I guess, who's been working closely with Henry Jones. Yeah. Very, very closely. She, she lies say. about being a Nazi, but I feel like he's probably met enough Nazis to know she had big this, Nazi this energy. This is my issue. Big this Nazi energy. This is my energy. issue. When, when, when people are like, well, okay, but he didn't know. She's like an a blonde Austrian in 1938. <laughs> what are the chances? Yeah, like, could we? Wouldn't you be like, hey, so, so you like, Nazi? You would kind of assume she's a Nazi, right? Yeah, I mean, I, you'd at least ask. I think he's like, he's like, well, my dad's working with her, so you know. Yeah, I don't like, want to uh, know. I don't want to. I'm just like, and you know, yeah, the the dad uh, son Elsa love. I always think about also. I love that. I love that. uh, I love that they get a little bit of a gag out of, uh, you know, the innate misogyny of the late eighties with the, oh, Doctor Schneider is a woman. No one ever could have seen this coming. Holy (laughs) shit! Oh my god! (laughs) Could you believe it? A a beautiful woman, and she's not wearing like giant glasses and doesn't have like badly cut bangs also i will say when you get the reveal of indiana jones's dad being played by sean connery that's like a top tier cast indiana oh my god it's so it doesn't get better than that they're so good together too like yeah just enjoyable it's a master class from both of them yeah uh, Jones discovers that there is a tomb underneath the library in Venice, and there they find a night shield, which has instructions that lead them to Iskanderun. There they discover that the Nazis have taken Henry to a castle in Austria. Jones sends Marcus Brody with the diary separately to Iskanderun to meet up with Gimli, and later he sleeps with the Nazi doctor. <laughs> Fun! <laughs> okay. Uh, Indy sneaks into the castle to rescue his dad, but Elsa reveals herself now to be the full-blown Nazi that she indeed is. Full-fledged believer in the Third Reich, double-crosses them. Indy and Henry escape. Henry slaps Indy for using Christ's name in vain, which is going to be a theme in this movie as Dr. Jones is steadily indoctrinated into the Christian Catholic faith. Um, the pair make their way to Berlin, where Indiana gets Hitler's autograph, and later they get out of town by sneaking aboard a Zeppelin and stealing a Luftwaffe plane. Crazy sequence! You could not believe that all of that happens in the time that you just described it. It's insane sequence! Unhinged. Uh, it, uh, Indiana fights more Nazis, uh, as does the uh, centuries-old secret sect who has been guarding the Grail all these years. Indiana rescues his dad and Dr. Brody from an out-of-control tank, which tumbles off a cliff. And it seems like Indiana goes over the edge, but you know what happened. You look at the clock. There's 30 minutes left mm-hmm. in this movie. Of course, he's still alive. And his dad, thinking that he was gone, embraces him. There's a wonderful, like, man, Harrison Ford is so good. There's a, a wonderful gag where uh, Henry... G- uh, Gimli and Marcus are all peering over the edge. They're they're shattered with grief. And Indiana, who climbed up, you know, some uh, some distance away, totters over to them and was like, "What are they looking at?" And looks <laughs> over, and then they realize that he's alive. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's really good stuff. Later, uh, in front of the Grail's hiding place, the Nazis shoot Henry in order to force Indy to go in and find the cup. Inside Indiana, as we mentioned, is uh, indoctrinated to Catholicism, being forced to kneel, uh, to read, uh, you know, Christ's name. But you know, what? Uh, I will say they make it look quite fun. Like there's lots they of do adventures. Make it, no, like, it's you got to walk across this, like a cool bridge. It's like, fantastic. He makes a leap of faith. Yes, as you mentioned, he eventually meets a two thousand year old knight who shows him a selection of cups. Enter 
financier Walter Donovan, who's like, yes, finally. He picks the most Rick Ross style chalice and promptly dies of old age. I mean, this is, even as a child, I was like, this man's Yeah, come on, this guy's like, my, yeah, that would not, on. Which cup do you think Jesus drunk from? Yeah, the gold. The you think, gold, it, what was he? Was he a gold forger? Chalice? No, yeah, come on. he was a humble man and he was a carpenter, babe. Like, put two and two together. Well, Indiana knows that. He picks the worst looking cup. And of course, it's the right one. He uses the cup to heal dad's gunshot wound. Uh, and the Grail Temple falls apart. You know, as they take the Grail out, Elsa dies when she tumbles They're into like, a fog. They're like, what happened to Elsa? Chasm. Now she's dead. She she's died. just gone. She's dying. And, uh, and you have to wonder, is Indy immortal now because okay. he drank from the cup? I think, about I think this... you have to keep drinking from I think, it, right? So I think what it might be is like, I think about this a lot. Because I was thinking about it when I was watching the new movie. I was thinking about it as a great excuse that they could have used if they wanted to recast Indiana Jones. So I think you have to stay within the seal of where the uh, grail is. And that's right, like why, the three nights. That, like why the soldier was there, the knight yeah. was there, and he was still old. And I think if you leave, I think it probably gives you some kind of like, you could you could argue that that's why he's still up and at him at like 85. Like it might have some residual, yeah. but I don't think you're getting that like 2,000 year old. Like it seems like the purpose of the cup is to keep someone alive so they can protect the cup. You know, one of those good old right. weird narrative cycles. But yeah, I do think right. that they leave it open to interpretation. Right. Well, before his job was to protect the cup, the um, that uh, that night crusader's job was to just kill muslim people in the holy land willy-nilly that was glad his job that he's the crusades in that, were I'm going i'm very on. glad that he is in been trapped in that cave for two thousand years that's what he deserves <laughs> man wait till he <laughs> finds out what's going on outside Woo! uh we go to kingdom of the crystal skull and by the way 15 years since kingdom of the crystal skull same as the dark knight is that <laughs> not insane why <laughs> What is a year? it? Uh, same not as fucking nuts. same as like fucking Iron Man. Like I, what a year for the movies. <laughs> if you'd have probably if you'd have given people a choice of which movie would end up being more impactful, they would have probably chosen the fourth Indiana Jones movie. I think that's probably like if you if you didn't if just you didn't based know? off of experience, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's 1957. The Cold War is ramping up. Also, aliens exist. Cash. And Indiana, yeah. And Indiana Jones has been doing uh, clandestine missions for the OSS and later the CIA. Um, the Russian agents, led by Galadriel, sneak into Area 51. They have also kidnapped Indy and his assistant Mac in Mexico. And they have brought the pair here because they want Indy to find this like steaming hot. E.T. corpse hidden somewhere <laughs> in the facility, and they think Indy's the guy to do it because he's seen one of these before. Also, the Ark of the Covenant is here, but nobody yeah, notices. Nobody knows. Jones leads the Russians to the uh, the hot pocket of alien meat. Uh, then Mac betrays Indy to the Russians, who, again, Indiana remains terrible at short picking round? the adult. Literally the most The only one who person, ever remained true. The, the only, only real one. one, and he never the shows up again. One. What's wrong with you, Lucasfilm? What's wrong with the Indiana Jones? Mistake. All the other adults that Indiana has ever contracted with eventually betray him. Yeah, it is every the single theme. time. Indy uh, manages to escape the clutches of the Russians, and he finds himself uh, eventually at the, uh, the a town that is the Call of Duty map nuke town. Yes. And Cannon. this turns out to be a, a, you know, a setup for a nuclear bomb test explosion so the army can see the damage that's going to be done. And all of a sudden the warning siren goes off and Indy realizes, oh shit, they're about to let off a nuke. He climbs inside a lead-lined fridge, which is uh, blasted some two miles away from the <laughs> site. It comes crashing to Earth at like something like 60, 70 miles an hour, and Indiana Jones absolutely survives. He's fine with only some light radiation poisoning, which is then scrubbed off later at the local army base. He's yeah, look, fine. I just want to say this is no more ridiculous than I going agree. down the Himalayas in a dinghy. I think this is the least bad idea that is in this movie. Like, this is fine to me. Like, Indiana Jones, he's essentially immortal. Uh, you know, it's. 57 no one knows what's going on with nuclear bombs yet like everyone's dumb he's in a lead line fridge sure sure he is he and again he has he has some amount of of holy grail water running through his veins exactly, so he's exactly. probably a little bit more 
hardy than your average. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ab- how, how old when was he? Sixty-five or yeah, something you know, at this when period he's in time. With, when he's actually with the added protection of the lead line fridge and the Holy Grail, then it all makes and sense. And the Holy Grail juice. Come on. The FBI interrogates Dr. Jones, but they set him free uh, in large part because like a general who we work with uh, is like, do you know who this guy is? He's been doing uh, secret missions for us for years and you got to let him go. Jones goes back to work at Marshall University, but again, Cold War tensions are really ramping up. The Red Scare is happening at this time and the FBI has been, you know, like taking away Dr. Jones' personal mm-hmm. effects and the stuff from his office. And so the the university is very, very sensitive at this time to being accused of harboring a commie. And so they tell Dr. Jones, you have to go on permanent leave or extended leave. I forget exactly how they phrase it. You're out, basically. You're out of here. You're out of here. We learn... We learn uh, right around here that both uh, Marcus and Henry Jones have passed in recent years. They should have drank from the Holy Grail. Truly, why um, not? They would still be here. Then there's this weird sequence where Jones boards a train but then gets off the train. So yeah. Dr. Jones is like, I'm going to New York to, to find my fortunes in New York City and figure out what my next move is. He gets on the train, but then a biker named Mutt just rides along the platform. And he's wearing by a, hat, the, uh, a really yes. memorable hat. Looks like Marlon, like a Marlon Brando cosplay, and yes. this, of course, is exactly. This gentleman is is played by the uh, the now canceled Shia LaBeouf, and uh, he. This is Mutt. This is Mutt, and Mutt has news. He says, "Hey, Harold Oxley, do you know him?" And the audience is like, "No, I've never heard of this guy." But luckily, Indiana Jones has heard of him. And Indiana Jones is like, yeah, my buddy, the ox. And he's like, yeah, the ox is going to be killed because he found a crystal skull in Peru. This means something to Indiana Jones who gets off the train. And uh, Mutt further tells Indiana that his mom, Mary, who managed to escape the assailants, uh, pointed him in Jones's direction saying this guy can help. Ox was apparently heading towards a legendary city called Akator. Uh, he and Mutt uh, end up escaping the KGB, who Indy realizes behind uh, all the nefarious stuff going on in this movie. And we realize it, too, because Kate Blanchett is in the beginning of this movie with a Rocky and Bullwinkle accent. So you realize that this is going to be <laughs> the big bad of the movie. Ox's trail leads them back to Peru. Indiana Jones back in Peru. He's back. At the, gr- at the grave of conquistador Francesco Oriana. Indian mud are attacked by weird poison dart wielding killers and they never come back. Another throwback to the original movie. Like, sure. Yeah. In the grave, the pair follows drawings of oblong shaped skulls to various mummified conquistadors, including Ariana, and they eventually discover a big old crystal skull which could not have been made with human technology. Indy finds, uh, unfortunately, Mac and a bunch of Russian soldiers are waiting outside for them. Indiana, again, is always getting ambushed outside. Every single time. Every single time. They take Mutt and Indy to the jungle where Indy is reunited with Ox, who is now apparently insane, driven insane by the Crystal Skull. The Russians want the skull because the skull can give you psychic powers and they want to create this psychic army and beat the sure. Americans. Yeah, okay. Indy uses the skull to make Ox kind of sane again. Then Galadriel is like, guess what? Look who I got. And produces Marion. Who reveals that she is Mutt's mom and Mutt is Indiana's son. Whoa, I think they're trying to set up a new (laughs) franchise. I think they are. And it looks like we have to say Marion is no longer drinking, which we love. No, I love that. Um, Karen Allen, happy to see her back here. Marion Ravenwood, good job. The Russians uh, say, listen, we're going to kill your longtime love, Marion, even though you never hardly talk to her, her like write ever, her, whatever. Like 15 yeah. years or something. We're, but, but we're going to kill her unless you help us. And so uh, this means that Indy, Mutt, Marion, and Ox have to escape and escape. They do. There is this like kind of slapstick gag with what is like a, a, a substance that is not quicksand, yada, yada, yada. Eventually, Jones and the Russians find Akator in the repository of the skulls. An alien reassembles itself that out happens. of skeletons. That happens. 
Galadriel is driven insane when the alien downloads all of the alien knowledge into her mind, which, which is, is what she on, wanted. Her, so first of she all, she did like, want it, but like, come on, I put mean, it on a. What did you think they were gonna do? Fucking hard drive, like whether yeah, put it on the like floppy that. disk. I feel like you are you're doing a great job of summing up just how absolutely off the rails the end of this movie goes. The big, I do think the first half of this movie is a very rompy Indiana Jones joint. I also think, I think like, so too. You know, I think Indiana Jones would be seen as a communist because he's a little bit liberal minded. I think there's interesting things at play here. And then it's like an alien downloads its brain into Kate Blanchett's <laughs> skull. Not an Indiana Jones swing through the CGI jungle next to the monkeys. And then an alien makes it so also why did they make so many skulls and why did they leave them on earth if you have these powerful skulls that will lead <laughs> that will give people psychic you know, power why did you stuff. just you're just like just chilling oh you know what maybe these humans need to be psychic maybe that would help we should note that once again spielberg has gone back to the toolkit and decided that the hero will not do anything <laughs> To solve the issue nope. between he and the antagonist, it and it is in fact it is in fact the alien downloading its brain who 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 gets rid of the uh, Russian top KGB agent. The alien then flies on in, in a UFO through an interdimensional portal. More interdimensional portals to come in this franchise. Mm -hmm. uh, Indy gets his job back and marries Marion. The end, which brings us to Indiana Jones. And the dial of destiny up next in the airlock. Okay, folks, we're stepping out of the airlock and into the year 1969, the year in which the Knicks would win their first of two championships mm. for Indiana Jones and the dial of destiny, directed by James Mangold, written by Jez Butterworth, John Henry Butterworth, David Cope, James Mangold, of course, based on characters by George Lucas and Philip Kaufman, Music, wonderful music by John mm. Williams, starring the 80-year-old Harrison Ford as Henry Jones, He's a.k.a. Old. Dr. Indiana Jones, Phoebe Waller-Bridge as Helena Shaw, the wonderful Mads Mikkelsen as Jurgen Voller, Antonio Banderas, wonderful surprise as Ronaldo. I was surprised. John, I didn't know. John Rhys Davies, who He's I'm back. not even going to look up. He's back, folks. Toby Jones in a brief role as Basil Shaw and more and more. Karen Allen also making a wonderful appearance. Um, should we try and recap it first before we uh, talk about it? want to do it by memory. <laughs> yeah, we want to try and do it by memory? <laughs> Let me All see. Right. So we open in 1969 and Dr. Indiana... No, actually, we open uh, in the last days of World War II. There is... Uh, Indiana Jones is a prisoner at some Nazi uh, fortress, and he is taken prisoner... Um, along with uh, his buddy Basil Shaw, they're here looking for like a spear that was used to stab Christ, but it turns out that's a fake, and the actual thing that the Nazis are after is uh, a, 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 the Antikythera mechanism, which was created by um, Archimedes and which eventually you will discover can allow people to travel through time, through fissures in time. Yes. It is the closing days of World War II and Indiana Jones and Basil end up on a plunder train, which is the Nazis yes. trying to steal all the shit. And yeah, they're like, we got to go stop. East. They're like, we got to stop. We got to stop. We got to get this train. We got to take this stuff to a museum. I fucking love museums. Museums are so important. But Mads Mikkelsen, looking a little bit de-aged, but still looking good. Harrison Ford, very de-aged. Very de-aged. Very de-aged. And better de-aging than we've usually seen, I will say. It's Tony up Jones, and down. Da it's up it's and up down. And down. Don't, yeah, don't look some at the of mouth is good. too much. I if will say this. you look at the mouth this. too much, it gets a bit Superman and Justice Can League. Can I, um, I, they should have de-aged the voice because that is the voice of an 80-year-old. He is <laughs> what <are> hoarse. He? <laughs> he is feeling, is... I was feeling like he had a cold. <laughs> I, I am a big, as you know, as I said earlier, I love River Phoenix as young Indiana Jones. <laughs> I'm saying cast a different actor. It would be fine. Oscar Isaac, Indiana Jones, Sebastian, Sebastian, uh, you know, what's his name? He plays, he's, yeah. he's the winner soldier. You know, there's all kinds of young, young men you can play. You can have play him. I was going to say Sebastian Shaw, like he was in the Hellfire Club. But anyway, he's looking <laughs> de-aged. They're on the train. It's very CG heavy, but Mads Mikkelsen is there, Jürgen Voller, and he really wants the Dial of Destiny. He believes. He wants that dial. He well, believes. Well, guess what? Guess what? Uh, uh, Dr. Jones and his buzzy Basil kind of foil this 
We flash forward to 1969, where Indiana Jones is living in New York City. He's old. He doesn't like that his young neighbors are partying and blasting the Beatles. His but students guess what? don't care anymore. They don't care anymore. Nobody cares about archaeology anymore. And all anybody wants to do is get high and go to Lovins and go to Woodstock and Sounds listen chill. to Grateful Dead and like fucking watch the the uh, <laughs> telecast of the moon landing. They don't want how dare they I? don't want it. How dare I try not to go to the war? How dare they do this anyway? Dr. Jones makes the acquaintance of Helena Shaw, his goddaughter, who he, he won in a string of women who he's, he abandoned over the course of Casually, his life. For like, Casually. For like 20, 20 like years. 20 her dad, years. Her dad Not Basil Shorter. Her <laughs> dad went insane because of the Dial of Destiny, a.k.a. the Antikythera, a.k.a. Archimedes Dial, which Indiana Jones gave to him, may I just say. And yes. then... Helena like runs a little scam on Indiana Jones and she's like, bro, where's the dial? I want to find it. I want to become like a famous archaeologist like you. Uh, but your dad, my dad said you lost it. We know that didn't happen. We know Indy gave it to him. And Indiana Jones is like, mm, oh, I think that's not what happened. But I, I trust you. So because you're an adult and you're going to help me. And that's, that's gone right. really well for me in the past. So he takes her to his little office in his school in downtown Manhattan. Sure. The college yeah. is there on the street, and there's a big parade. Hunter College, too, I believe it is. Yes, yes, yes. And there is a huge parade going on for the astronauts who have come back successfully from the moon landing. And Helena and Indy go there, and he shows her, I actually have the Dial of Destiny. And you know what? You can have it, because I trust you. Uh-uh, bad choice. Because Helena betrays him, she locks him in, and he gets chased down by an interesting collection of FBI slash CIA agents and Nazis who are working yes. together. That's right. Because it turns out, folks, that uh, our good friend, Jürgen Voller, is in the States now as part of Operation Paperclip. Mm -hmm. He is one of the Nazis who the U.S. government has tapped to help with the uh, rocketry program, which put the, uh, the astronauts on the moon that everybody is celebrating. And so apparently because of this, Jürgen Waller has like a lot of leverage and just gets to like assemble his only like mercenary Nazi crew. To find the dial the, of destiny. Yeah, under the watchful eyes of the CIA who are watching his Nazis like just murder regular people in the streets and like people who work at hunter college mm -hmm. and they just like look the other way and go well i don't know this guy like invented rockets so Guess we can't okay. do anything you know he was he is a nazi war criminal who's openly <laughs> racist to people in america <laughs> but don't worry about it he created a rocket so turns out thanks to sala the returning john reese davis turns out helena is a, a little scammer she's been selling antiquities That's she's right. not an archaeologist she's she a survivor doesn't respect she, museums. Doesn't, she doesn't like museums she's taking them from a museum <laughs> but she's not giving them back she's selling them to the highest bidder so that means indiana jones has to go to tangier and so does jürgen voller and his crew of like nazi cia agents right <laughs> who then shoot uh, one of the CIA agents and just kill her dead. And the RIP, American government response like, the only is like nothing. Character. She was interesting and then they killed her off. Yeah. Um, so a lot of stuff happens. You know, there's they go many the chases. There's many, many chases. You go in a little tuck tuck chase. It's the Jurgen has the Dial of Destiny. Helena has the Dial of Destiny. Indiana Jones has the Dial of Destiny. Lots of MacGuffin swapping. Then. Jürgen, with uh, Helena, a.k.a. Wombat, his, uh, you know, his, uh, apparently has killed her, and with Dr. Indiana Jones, at a, again, a spry age of 80 as his prisoner, flies off with the Dial of Destiny in a period-correct Luftwaffe transport plane in search, using this dial, of a fissure through time that will deliver him to 1938, 39, I forget the exact year. I believe it was... With the idea, yeah. get this twist, Rosie, to kill Hitler. Oh Jürgen is like, Hitler fumbled the bag. I'm smarter than him. Put me in, coach. I want to play as the Fuhrer. I'm going to go in there. I have a meeting with Hitler. I know the date of the meeting with Hitler. I'm going to meet the guy. I'm going to kill him. And then I guess 
The Nazis are just going to coalesce around me. They're not going to put me to death for killing the Fuhrer. They're going to all coalesce around me as the leader, and I will lead Nazi Germany to victory in World War II. That's his plan. Yeah, it seems silly. <laughs> but... It, okay it was a good twist okay. it was like they they were like uh, what about if a nazi wanted to kill hitler and then they were like but he's the bad guy so how do we make him worse well hitler was stupid and i'm gonna be a better hitler okay that's so right then i'm gonna flying. do it better than him but guess what archimedes was according to according to indiana jones archimedes idiot fool idiot. he didn't know he didn't about, know about continental, continental drift, drift. <laughs> he, he didn't, didn't know that in his math know. so guess what they fly through the fissure in time followed by the hilarious 12-year-old Teddy, who is Helena's, like, sidekick, and he can also fly a plane. Good for him. So then these two planes end up going through the fissure, and they're not in Nazi Germany. Good. They are in Sicily, which is where they were meant to be, but it's, like, 314 BC. Yes, yeah, something something like that. Something and the- occurred. And the uh, the uh, you know the late Roman Rep- mid Roman Republic I don't know was it I guess middle Roman Republic is busy laying siege to uh, Syracuse where Archimedes lives, and long story short, folks, what we find out is uh, that Archimedes actually rigged the Dial of Destiny because he needed help. He knew he was going to need help in this siege to fight off the Romans, and so he created this dial with the hopes that whoever finds it would go back through the time fissure with yeah. some help so that and, they could fight off the Romans. And they scare the Romans off because they're in two planes and the Romans think they're dragons and that helps. And also the the dial is essentially a trap because it will never yeah. go anywhere else. Archimedes it only goes to the siege of Syracuse. You. So you'll go into right. the you'll go in there Archimedes also keeps Jürgen Voller's watch. He's like, this is useful. I feel like that is a steampunk level time change. Like steampunk is based on the idea that like, what if people had invented a computer in the Victorian age? Very, very paraphrased there, but generally that's the idea. I feel like if there was a watch in 314 BC, the entire world would have changed i feel like that is enough of technology <laughs> but who am I? I don't know anything i don't know anything about time travel or archimedes so it, indiana jones decides he wants to stay i don't know why because he loves history we should add okay so uh, uh it is actually 213 to 212 bc oh, sorry sorry no 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 but like what, what do we know <laughs> we don't and, know anything we're not historians one of the fun things kind of fun things and I don't know how purposeful it is about this movie is so Jürgen Voller was taken to the US as part of part of Project Paperclip in which the United States was acquiring geniuses to help their military uh, mm. you know projects uh, and interestingly part of the siege of Syracuse the siege of Syracuse was part of a larger struggle against Carthage but the Romans were well aware of the genius of Archimedes and had orders to capture him alive and bring him back to Rome so that he could build all these fantastic contraptions yeah. like the ones he had built to defend Syracuse. So he was going to be kind of the Jürgen Voller of it's his It's a nice narrative time. echo. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Dr. Jones has been wounded in this whole thing and he's he's bleeding out and he's like, they get to meet Archimedes and uh, they speak Greek to him and apparently Greek of 213 BC is just like Greek now. Exactly the same. I, and, and so they converse with him and, uh, <laughs> and Jones is like, leave me here at 213 He's like, I don't have nothing <laughs> to live for. My son, by the way, sorry, we should have mentioned this earlier. Oh yeah, I was, you gotta by mention the, way, the son. <laughs> R.I.P. Ma, he died in Vietnam. They killed oh, him off. Oh, he uh, died in Vietnam. Probably because he was trying to knife people instead of using guns. I'm saying um, he had a lot of problems, so that spinoff never yeah. occurred for him, even though he did pick up the hat at the end of he Kingdom of the Crystal the Skull. Hat, but we'll uh, yeah, never get to use dead. it because he died in Vietnam. And that is incredibly harsh, but gave me a chuckle. And Indiana Jones, the worst thing about it is, Ma only signed up just to piss off his dad. Because his dad they didn't drop like the that, The way they comic. drop that in the, in the course of his conversation with Archimedes is 
so fucking like, like, I don't have anything to live for. He's got nothing to live for, man. It's like his <laughs> son's Mark dead. went to Vietnam. Mark went to Vietnam. Marion left him. Marion left wanna me. He doesn't want to do the effort to make that relationship work. He's just going to stay in <laughs> yeah. Rome, okay? That's right. I, That's what men me, do. He's going to stay. in ancient Sicily in 213 BC. Literally. I want to live here. I want to die here. The Romans men, are about to He's also kill been shot. Here. So he's going to die he's, soon. He's Men will literally gonna die. fly through a fissure in time and go back to ancient Rome instead of going to therapy, apparently. So he's so he's there. Helena's like not having it. Helena talks, yeah, she talks some sense, well, socks some sense in Yeah, she, she punches him in the face and she's like, you're out, bro. We're going right, back to New York. And then carries him aboard Teddy's uh, little plane and Teddy's little plane, which is already carrying Teddy and the rightful pilot of the plane who was asleep in the back. Hilarious, unnecessary carry... Indiana Jones gag, by the <laughs> way. That was like, I was like, sure. Why is, we guy. don't need that guy, but he was there. And now the plane, this little ass plane has to carry, has to carry and they don't the show rightful it pilot, because little Teddy, Helena. <laughs> And what? Yeah, and, and Indiana and an Jones. unconscious Indiana Jones back to the Fisher, and it does. And so they end up back in 1969 in New York City. Indiana Jones wakes up in his apartment. He has been nursed back to health by Helena and Marion, who has arrived and apparently decided, you know what, this guy is a toxic, shitty partner mm -hmm. who started messing around with me when I was. Of an a illegal child. age, an let's, age let's when see. I could not absolutely consent to whatever was going on, and then later, even after we said, "Let you know what, let's let's get hitched and let's finally do the thing," I guess abandoned me because he can't, uh, you know, ever stop heeding the siren call of artifacts from other cultures, <laughs> and so. Uh, but you know what? It, he's been shot in in and has just come back from two thirteen BC, and and <laughs> so I. Am just absolutely going to put the groceries away in his refrigerator, and we're going to patch things up. And they patch things up. Yeah, that actually, I have to say, from the whole movie, that was the moment that really, like, emotionally resonated for me. I just think because I Karen think Karen, Karen Allen's fucking great, and I will say, I just want to give Karen Allen some props here because she has talked quite extensively. This was the quote she said: "I have thought that I would be majorly a part of the film." So she was under the impression that originally she thought that she was supposed to be a major role. She told that to the Hollywood Reporter. And she was kind of surprised that in the end, because originally I guess Steven Spielberg had been working on this movie and she was meant to be more of a role. And then that changed when James Mangold came in. I would have liked to see more. I thought that was one of the most like not like most emotionally resonant moments and it was just lovely and i was happy for them so like good for them but also you made many good points i kind of wish marion had moved on and gone to therapy too and, and found a more healthy partner but you know what they got a nice apartment in new york the sun's coming through the window ball. you can drive it's gonna be a multi out there it's gonna be a multi-million dollar apartment in oh, like 20, 30 years when <laughs> Indiana Jones might still be alive at like He's got that juice running through him, baby. <laughs> the juice is running through him. He could do okay. it. Okay. So here's the thing about this movie, which is fine. It's, it's fine. It's it's perfectly fine movie. It is a bomb, certainly in the context of its 300 plus million reported budget 350 yes. to 400 million it only made 60 million dollars in an opening weekend and then dropped off precipitously um and gosh let's talk about why let's talk about that budget first because reported Oof. 350 to 400 i before well, marketing that i don't believe that there's any way this movie I don't yeah it, it has to be something weird going on yeah because there's just no way this movie Cost three hundred and fifty million dollars. One did, and two, it does not look like it. If it did, it, does, it didn't make it to the screen. I think yeah. that was my biggest struggle with this movie. Is like, look, the movie one is too long, two and a half hours long. Don't need it. Should have been two hours long. Should have been ninety minutes long. I know we say that a lot on here. Look, sometimes I love a long movie, yeah. And I know movies like Endgame is really the the one that made it seem like, well, look, this is like a, almost a three hour long movie and people will go and watch it five times in the cinema. That has changed post COVID. What people will choose to go to the cinema to see and rewatch. And they know this will end up on Disney plus soon. You can make a shorter, thriftier, more efficient movie. And a lot of times it's going to, 
people can see it more times in the cinema you can show it more times and it can be a more bracing experience this i've watched the indiana jones movies so many times lucasfilm many was times. like a religion many, many 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 times in my house growing up right like vhs lucasfilm you could not avoid it goonies yeah. all that yes. stuff like uh, and the truth is i've seen all of them and this movie did not, it didn't have that bracing engagement, even in the way of like a Temple of Doom, which like we said is like so horrifically racist, that would get you caught That's up in the emotion, in the yes. in the way that the movie was made. And then you're like, oh, I wish it wasn't like this, or oh, I'm going to turn it off, this bit's really fucked up or whatever. This movie is very by the book, modern Hollywood blockbuster. I don't even think it really fits into the cool kind of requel style yeah. because Indy is the main character. They don't do a great job building a new character that you want to follow and it doesn't seem like they're interested in doing that like it doesn't feel like they're trying to set helena up for anything here but it also feels like they don't really say goodbye to indy in a concrete way I, that, and i agree with you i think the biggest problem for me was like visually there were cool there were cool sequences but i missed that practical i know i sound so old i'm sorry but i'm an old person same. like i can't help it when i think about the, we talked about the River Phoenix opening to Last Crusade, you know, on the train. There's so much fun seeing him scrambling around on that train, like yeah. having this adventure. There's a huge train fight sequence here and it's all CG and they're de-aged yeah. and the rain is CG and the train is CG and everything else is CG. And it just misses that, you know, the boulder chasing there's Indiana a, Jones. Yeah, there's through a the, lack of visceralness. It like, doesn't it just feel feels, real. It also yeah. feels almost too slick, which is kind of goes against the pulpiness. And not necessarily slick in a good way, but like visually actually slick. And, you know, super producer Chris brought up it before we were talking about it. And I thought about it too, because obviously they showed the Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning trailer before this movie. There's a huge train sequence in that. And we know it was practical. And that movie apparently cost almost $100 million less than the highest end budget of this movie. I feel I understand Harrison Ford's old, but like maybe that should make He's you question the situation. I just feel like the, the lack of practical, the over CG, it was hard for me to connect in an emotional way with the yeah. characters until really that like quiet moment at the end with, with Marion and, and Indiana Jones. And I think a lot of that did come from that. It, it's doesn't look like it costs that much money and it feels like a lot of the heart of the old movies is missing and i think a lot of that is to do with those those visual choices yeah i i think moreover when talking about this movie's disappointing box office performance it, i think i haven't seen anybody talk about this but this movie is it is it has attempted to do something that no other movie has done, which is sell a reported $350 million budget movie and earn a massive return for a vehicle whose star is 80. Yeah, an action Think about, vehicle. Like the, an, action an action vehicle. vehicle. This has never been no, done this before. Is, when you said this, I thought this was really a great point that kind of people aren't really talking about. It's almost an untested product, even though it's an IP. Yeah, I think it's never been done before. Never They've been never done. put a person this old in the starring and role of an action movie. We were talking Big about... budget action movie. We were talking about this, like, in the group chat, and, like... The funny thing is about it, the closest comp is like an Expendables movie, right? And those sure. guys are like or 20 years younger and there's about 10 of them in the last one, Expendables 3. And that movie made like $200 million. So it's not even, or like, there is not I, even like a I, billion dollar version of this that has been done even to the closest comp. Now there are, uh, you could point at like Lionsgate stuff and say, you know, John Wick is older, Taken, Liam Neeson and Taken, you're still talking it, like still, 30 years younger. You're still talking about like in their 60s. Like mm -hmm. Harrison Ford again is 80 and I understand with the de-aging, but let's say the de-aging was seamless. You know how old he is. I know how old Harrison Ford is. I, like, also I know just, that. I feel like they've done it enough times now to know that I don't think audiences really respond well to de-aging. I just think it's like just cast someone younger. Sebastian Stan, the person whose we name absolutely... I did not give the credit to. So many people wanted to see him as a young Luke Skywalker for years. Yeah. There were all these conversations about how he looked like Mark Hamill when he was younger. You know, the idea of casting someone new is exciting. I understand that we had 
the Han Solo experience, which didn't necessarily hit in the right way. But then I think again, a better movie. Again, I, I'll say it again. I think a better movie than people remember. But yeah, continue. yes, I I agree too. And also, I will say, I think as well, arguably a character who we already knew his younger version of. So maybe you yeah. don't need to do that. But when you're returning a character, Luke, you know Indiana Jones, if you want to do that, don't be afraid to cast a new person, guys. The de aging. It's scary. It's given on Cali Valley. Yeah. So I think that, you know, that it, it's a thing that nobody's really talking about, which is mm-hmm. the, the kind of unprecedented nature of trying to execute this level of movie with a star in his 80s. And then I think secondarily, listen, uh, Shia LaBeouf is not the right guy, but one thing that I think Crystal still did kind of do right was pick that co-star who could have ostensibly taken the reins mm-hmm. of the series who made I love Phoebe Waller-Bridge I'm not sure that that's the right actor and I she's like good in this role more. she's good but it's also like I, I thought there was some cool aspects there the idea of Helena kind of being a criminal and stuff and not yeah. necessarily having but it didn't grab me as a character I wanted to particularly know more about or I would have liked to see a younger, more action-focused star, Ella Belinska. I love you. I'm always trying yeah. to get you these roles, but like someone buzzier. I would love I'm to just see, saying, like, yeah, if you're thinking buzzier, about making also this someone who's reported more, 350 million dollars back. I want to see someone who's doing stunts. If Harrison can't yes. do the stunts, give a young person a someone's stunt. Someone's got to do them. Someone's yeah. got to see it. Someone's got to do a stunt, please. I just want to see one stunt. You know, it's. I think. So, what do you? Fi- I feel like you made another great point when we were talking about this, like before, which you kind of were like. I think it's also about quality. These box office numbers, yes. you know. It, it, let's talk it, about make it. a good movie. The At Flash, the end of the day, make, make a good, good movie. movie. I feel That's like it. that. I feel like that is really like a big problem with the Flash. I feel like if yeah. they'd have made a really great movie, even despite the controversies or the runtime or anything else, people will find it and go to it. Look at something like Elemental, right? I have yet to see it, but that Pixar movie. Pixar that, movie. The yep. movie didn't do well in its mm-hmm. opening run. It was Pixar's biggest flop, especially if you consider inflation since, you know, Toy Story, which obviously was an untested first movie. So that didn't make a lot of money the way Pixar movies do now. But every week that movie has been making money because it had an yep. A minus cinema score, I believe, and yep. families are going to see it and it is still finding an audience. Now, will it still be a, a loss leader? Maybe. But I think that the quality of it and the fact people want to see the film tells you everything you need to know about it. There's a reason Spider-Verse didn't flop. It was fucking brilliant. Like, they're too concerned about the IP and not as concerned about telling a good story. Yeah, that to me is really, when people talk about IP fatigue and and Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny possibly being an example of IP fatigue and, uh, you know, you can point at any number of, of... stories about Mar- various Marvel projects. Yeah, franchise TV, fatigue. W, franchise fatigue. I think at the end of the day, it's kind of, like this is dead obvious and I'm not saying that it's easy to make something good, but just make something good. Like Indiana Jones and Dial of Destiny is a perfectly fine movie, yeah. but it's not like great. Mm-hmm. And if you want to make people sit back in their seats and spend tons of money and you want to be able to mm-hmm. recoup that 300 reported 350 million dollars again i don't understand how this possibly could have cost you <laughs> then your best bet is to come out with something that's really just gangbusters and this is just not it's not so like when people are like oh it's not a hit it's also not a it's not a great movie yeah i also think so i think something that kind of I think about a lot as well is like, why do you make it, right? Is it because, so The Flash suffered from that because it was originally meant to be this like ground, originally it's a Flash movie, then it's a groundbreaking repurposes the DCEU, then it's not that. So it loses the why did it get made and you don't necessarily get some great retelling or important new story, which, you know, a lot of what happened in The Flash, as I've said many times, already happened in the CW. Like, why did they make it? Indiana Jones feels like that to me especially when it's coming from someone like james mangold who you know made logan which is like one of the greatest yeah comic book movies ever made a truly great movie that's a movie where you felt like oh i need to know this about the character i'm so glad i saw this story 
this Indiana Jones didn't tell me that. I didn't know why this needed to be added to the law. You know, that's where I think people start to feel like, is it a bit of a cash grab? There's not necessarily something new. I also think it's interesting to try and still be telling a story that was nostalgic to the men who made it in the 80s. Like Indiana yeah. Jones was pulpy and nostalgic to George Lucas and Steven Spielberg. They wanted to recreate a storytelling tradition that they had enjoyed as children and they wanted to bring it back and do their own version do we still need to be trying to tell that story like 50 years later with no right. reconsideration that's kind of what i was thinking a lot in the movie was like how do you tell a cool pulp story in an unexpected different way that's what i think they didn't do with this i think they tried to I make agree. it too much like the originals and instead, I think there is a cool space to tell an Indiana Jones story that subverts or recontextualizes or adds to the law. And I don't necessarily think this did that. And I think people do want that when they come to an, uh, an IP or franchise yeah. storytelling. Um, and then my final thing about why maybe it doesn't work, I, you know, I don't know about if this necessarily led to, the, to it bombing the way it did, but one, one of the things that kind of, I thought could have been better. We're going to cover the Mission Impossible franchise, mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to cover Mission Impossible Seven. Um, and I thought one of the things that Fallout 2018's Fallout oh, did really well. I love that was movie. was underline that Ethan is getting older, and he's mm -hmm. not as good as he used to be, and he can't fight the bad guys alone anymore. It takes him a little longer to get up. Uh, and there's some of that with Indiana it's more Jones done in a Destiny. gag way though. It's where done in a gag way in, though. In it's Mission done as like a it's it's about comments. The it's the it's show don't tell, and yeah. it's also about what that means for the state of the world. If he can't right. be the hero we need, what with Indiana Jones, it's like I'm climbing up a giant mountain, but my knees are sore. I gotta take a break <laughs> now, you know. And yeah. and that's really the only moment where you're like. Okay, he's showing his age, but like we, but calling it out, you're right, weakens it. And furthermore, it's not like they avoid the subject of how old he is. Mm -mm. Like it, it's a he's retiring topic, right? But you never. He's still fighting the Nazis. He's still like climbing out of windows. He's still leaping onto the back of a horse. There's which you understand is a d is a de aged face swapped uh, thing with a stuntman on the back of that horse. <laughs> And it's, but you, but there's no show. It's mm -hmm. all, hey, you're old now. Hey, old man. Hey, old guy. Hey, how old are you? And very secret no, invasion. Like, you're washed. Did yeah, anyone washed. tell you you're washed? And but there's no like, there's very rarely Indiana Jones like kept trying to catch his breath or being mm -hmm. like, I can't get up, mm -hmm. or he's still getting up. And there's that moment which you mentioned when they're climbing out of the tomb. But that's it for the yeah. show part of it and it f and it felt disingenuous to me I unless know. they really lean into he's got the grail juice in and it. then and they didn't do that because i look i'm gonna he say that i, I would have liked everybody knows if you listen to this podcast or you read what i the stuff that i write or whatever i love like fun out there stories so yeah. you're not, you're rarely gonna hear me say this yeah but i did feel like for once this could have done with being a bit more like grim and gritty and i'm like yeah, i rarely I ever so say that but, I, you know, a tired... Ha his son died. Like, I want to see the, how that impacted him. His, he's old. He can't do it the same yeah, way, but he's got to go on this mission. I feel like yes. there could have been some gravitas and grit the, that we didn't get. The emotional culmination of this film for Indiana Jones is him begging to be left in ancient Greece where to he die. wants to die. Like, and that could have really been an emotional, like, gut punch mm -hmm. if... Some of that feeling of his impending mortality was was more spread out through the film. Yeah, but you really never feel that. You I, don't. you know, you don't feel that. And I think, and here's another take: the de aging. We talked about like get a younger actor. I think you could. I think if you didn't do the de aging and if you got a younger actor, or you just told the whole story in the present. Then we could have sat with an older Indiana exactly, Jones and exactly. really let that kind of melancholy, that emotional impact of this mm -hmm. guy and how long is he going to be with us and how long can he keep running around and, and climbing out of tombs. 
that, that could have really hit us a little harder. Yeah. And I think it's sad that they didn't, in, instead of using that, mm-hmm. our, our natural affinity for Harrison Ford, as we come towards the end of his career, they steered away from it. And I thought that was a mistake. I thought that was a mistake. You know, feel free to see it if you're an Indiana Jones fan. Again, it's not a terrible movie. It's fine. No, and I'm sure it will be. There will be cinemas that I'm sure will do reruns of all of them, yeah. and I'm sure it will gain a cult following, just as Kingdom of Crystal Skull did. Like, is you know what these movies they ebb and flow. It wasn't the great joyous send off that I would hope it would yeah. be, and I would get if it was if I felt like it was for a different generation or something. I I actually saw it in an early bird screening with captions and everyone in there was like 70. So it was fantastic. Uh, So it's Sunday morning. So it is for a different generation, actually. (laughs) You're right. But like, I don't feel, I, I, it didn't hit with, it seems like with a wider audience, but you know what? I'm sure it'll find some love and, and you'll have fun if you watch it, but it is, it's long. (laughs) It is quite long. Um, Up next, Nerd Out. In today's Nerd Out, where you tell us what you love and why, a theory you're excited to share, or if you have a quick question that we can answer, Cameron offers a secret invasion theory. So, Cameron is about to pose a theory that I think would make the most sense for the way they go forward post-secret invasion. So, Cameron, I'm giving, I'm saying you should put this on the We Were Right for the future. Just thought I'd submit my theory after watching the premiere of Secret Invasion. After seeing the detainment system the scrolls are using to trap the humans that they are imitating, I couldn't help but think, this is how we get Black Widow back, right? Question mark. I can just see the final episode where they're clearing the facility of human prisoners and they find a room with ScarJo. I don't know, maybe a pipe dream, but I'm calling it. Okay, so I'm going to say, now that we're three episodes in, I don't think it's going to yes. happen in the show. But I do I think the future of what they do with the scrolls and this technology is used to bring back Black Widow. You know, you could even if you wanted to, it's like they they saved Tony's body and they, you know, healed him or something. Yeah. Like I do think that it will go more comic book heavy in the future. And the fact that the scrolls have this detainment unit in Secret Invasion, though it is a more grounded show will be used as a MacGuffin in the future to reintroduce characters that uh, have been sorely missed. I agree. And I will also say in the original Secret Invasion, um, that comic book arc was used to bring back Bobby Morse, Mockingbird, mm-hmm. the, uh, the, um, you know, the swashbuckling uh, secret agent, uh, romantic partner of Hawkeye who had passed away I don't know, 20 years earlier in real time and was dead, dead. And they use secret invasion to, to bring her back and say, actually, no, she was in skull, yeah. scroll detainment this whole time. So I think, so it's, yeah, it can absolutely be done. I think it's, I think that is going to be what we see. Will it happen with black widow? I don't know. I think they could want to move back to that more traditional Avengers team. Now that the I MCU bet you they isn't do. hitting in a certain, in the same way, but I think that this is going to happen, whether it's with Black Widow or other characters. I think that though this version of Secret Invasion has not been taken very heavily from the comics, I think we'll see it used and seeded as a way to reintroduce and introduce bigger characters going forward. Let me ask you this, because I think you're exactly right, and I bet you that some execs at Disney or Mm -hmm. creative movers and shakers are saying... Can we get any of that original cast back? Yeah. I think Black Widow is on the table, but at what point, what are the odds that we get, say, Cap or oh. Tony back? Because I think okay. that it could I easily Cap, happen with the multiverse now. You 100%. just go, go to the multiverse see, and get another one. We're going to see Steve in the suit again. No question. In my opinion, I, I think I think that's going to happen. I think Chris Evans loves the character. I think the fans love him. Bucky's still involved so they can come back and recreate. I have always been of the belief post watching uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s Dr. Doolittle movie that he will be coming back to the MCU. I, I do believe it will happen. I think Tony is a fair bet. I've always been interested even from before Endgame in the idea of doing like the young Tony stuff that they did in the comics where you could have like a younger Tony come in. But I think we could see a Robert Downey Jr. cameo or even with the scrolls, 
a potential return. I think it's most likely to happen in the soon to be announced uh, renamed Avengers movie, Avengers versus X-Men that I'm sure is going to happen instead of one of the many Kang films that were planned. But I think we could see whenever the the X-Men Fantastic Four come back, I think they might try and bring back those original Avengers just for a little bit, just to make Do they do old cap? Do you think they do old cap? Not as not like Joe Biden cap from the end of but maybe like maybe like he's like he's kind of more like a you know a a rogue like he's a bit grizzled, a little bit more of like an old man cap, like how we would call old man Logan in the comics, but not like I don't think Joe Biden cap's coming back in the But not like a shredded comics old cap. No, no, I think that you think they do shredded comics old cap do it. I think it's gonna be like old man, like old man Logan or old man Deadpool or old man cap i would like to see shredded old cap just wait like 20 years till chris evans old and then bring him back thanks cameron if you have theories passions or quick questions you want to share hit us up at x-ray at crooked.com instructions in the show notes well that's it for us any plugs rosie uh yes i will be at san diego comic-con this year bum, 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 bum. Bum. if you want to be if you want to come and see me i'll be moderating two really cool panels for webtoon on Thursday morning and Friday morning, I should, I may be announcing something very cool and unexpected, even unexpected to me on Saturday, but we have to wait and see if that's going to happen. So I'll be in San Diego. So as always, you can spot where I am on Instagram, Rosie Marks, and come and say hi to me. I'll have zines and cool stuff. Catch the next episode of X-Ray Vision on Friday, July 14th, where we'll be covering episodes three and four of Secret Invasion. And you can watch full episodes of the podcast on YouTube. Check us out on Twitter at XRVPod and join our Discord where the link will be in the show notes so you can hang out with a bunch of cool fans and me and Jason. Five star ratings, five, five star five, reviews. Five, we five, need them. Five, we got to have them. You got to give them to us. Here's one from Mallrat42. One of my favorites. My only complaint is that Jason and Rosie don't cover literally everything I consume. So I <laughs> guess my real complaint is that the multiverse doesn't actually exist, but that isn't their fault. Ah, thank you so much, Mallrat42. See you next time.